Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Buying a Home in the Netherlands webinar. Thank you all for joining and uh, being patient until uh, 1035 so that everyone could join. Um, good to know before we start is that today's session will be recorded and shared. So if you miss anything or you have to jump out because of a, a work meeting, for example, um, no worries. We'll share everything tomorrow with you <clears throat> so you have all the time to uh, go through it again. Cool. So my name is Ludo. Um, I live in Amsterdam, in the north of Amsterdam, with my partner and with my two beautiful cats. So if you're all lucky today, uh, a cat might walk <laughs> walk by. Um, I'm a buying a manager in the Amsterdam region. <clears throat> so um, well, actually the greater Amsterdam region, meaning also places like Zandam, Almere, uh, but also Amstelveen and well, all around. So if you are looking to buy a home in the Amsterdam area, most likely you will be in contact with me. Uh, before we get into uh, any detailed stuff, I'm also very curious uh, well, where you are in the process, uh, who you are, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a, a small poll. Um, I'll start the poll and then I'll give everyone a few minutes to fill it in. So we're curious, of course, how you found us, uh, but also what uh, phase of your life you're in. Um, well, what made you decide to buy, et cetera, et cetera. It's of course not obligated, but if you do um, have the time to fill it in, then it uh, would be great to personalize the webinar a little bit to your needs. <clears throat> nice, we see some numbers coming in. So we have a lot of people between the age of 25 and 34. It's the nice transfer tax exemption age. <laughs> and the majority is actually not looking in Amsterdam at the moment, but in other cities. Feel free to pop in the city in the chat as well if you um, want to share where you're looking to, to find a home. And I'll end the poll here. I'll share the results with you all so you can see a little bit uh, where we're at. <clears throat> a nice mix of singles, couples, and families. A majority would like to settle in the Netherlands. Well, it's always a nice compliment for us. Um, and uh, let's see in the chat. Uh, we see Utrecht, Groningen as well. We just uh, got a new colleague dedicated for the Groningen areas. So that's good news. Cool. <clears throat> let's continue. So, um, well, we think the greatness is achieved in the agency of others. What does that mean? I'm not here by myself, but we do it with a, a nice team. Um, we are from all over the world. We have a colleague from Brazil. Uh, we have a Katie who's joining us today. Uh, she'll be managing the Q&A. She is from Cyprus. Um, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit, Katie? Yeah, sure. Yeah, this sure. Is this the this moment for me moment for me to shine. <laughs> Uh, can you see me? Can you hear me clearly? I can. Yeah. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie. I'm just going to be quiet here today in the chat support. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to pop them there or in the Q&A. And then I'll leave uh, Ludo shine away for you guys. <laughs> Thanks very much, Katie. Cool. So yeah, we uh, we have a wonderful team um, uh, supporting each other and, and making sure that uh, at the end we can find and secure a home for you all. Um, a brief introduction to EHN. Well, we are not traditional real estate agents. Why is that? It's because we are um, only dedicated to helping our clients buy a property and rent a property. So we don't sell and we don't rent out properties. That means that um, our expertise is really in the um, buying and rental part. Um, <clears throat> we don't charge a commission, we charge a fixed fee, meaning that there is no incentive for us, uh, for you to buy at a higher price. Um, the goal is, of course, to spend as less as we can. Um, and uh, well, because of the fixed fee, uh, that is definitely what we do. Um, plus, the majority of, of us, just like you saw in the previous slide, um, is an expat or has been an expat. So we know what it's like to settle in a new country um, and therefore can, can uh, understand where you are in the process. <clears throat> well, EHN adds value as well. 
Um, good to know is that selling agents take offers from EHM more seriously, and we can sometimes book viewings when it's no longer possible, meaning that um, if the viewing spots are full, selling agents tend to have an extra day just for clients with or potential buyers with buying agents. Um, plus, they feel more comfortable for us to just walk around the house while they're um, guiding other people. So um, that definitely have, has an added value. We support, of course, by reviewing Dutch legal and property documents, so you know exactly what you're buying very important. We help define market value through market data. Uh, we'll get to this a little bit later on, but there is quite a difference between asking price and market value, so it's important to know the market value. Um, and of course, we'll inform you about rules and regulations. And like I said, we know what it's like to be an expat, so um, uh, we want to make sure you guys don't make the same mistakes that we have made in the, uh, in the past. Um, as you might have seen, I'm not doing the uh, webinar by myself. We have a, a fantastic person from Mr. Mortgage here who will be able to um, tell us everything about mortgage-related topics. Robin, would you like to introduce you and your team? Yeah, definitely. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for, for joining today. Um, my name is Robin, Robin Uitaag, uh, so the second from the from the left, and uh, my team, uh, I'm joined with uh, Cesar, uh, Egle, and Uskan, and that's a marvelous team, also uh, with uh, international experience, either lived abroad or have experience abroad, or with uh, the culture where you grew up in, and so on. So um, that's a very nice uh, team to work together with to help you, essentially, get an understanding of your finances and in the end of course that uh, much valued home that you're buying to get it financed and that you can sleep easily uh, at night as well knowing that everything is taken care of correctly um and that's uh, that's what we enjoy doing we have uh, expertise with uh, helping expats and internationals with their finance and uh, we guide you through the whole housing process together with uh, preferably expert housing network of course uh, to get your bid accepted and get everything done smoothly so that's uh, that's what we do <clears throat> Thanks very much, Robin. <clears throat> so, uh, well, today's goal is to add value to you. Uh, how do we do that? Um, by sharing information freely. Some things that are good to know, I'm going to leave it to you, Robin. Uh, the NHG, can you explain a little bit about that? You're on mute, uh, Robin. <clears throat> There we are. <laughs> no worries, but thank you for letting me know. <laughs> um, so NSG is a kind of an insurance arrangement. Um, what that means is that when you buy a home in the Netherlands for up to an amount of 355,000 euros, um, you can opt for the NSG arrangement. What that means is that you kind of have a security that when you buy the home and God forbid the property value decreases, Rest assured, I don't necessarily expect a massive decrease in the property value anytime soon, but let's say it does. And disaster strikes even further because you lost your job without fault of your own uh, and uh, you cannot afford mortgage anymore. So you have double trouble really. So the property value decreased and you cannot afford mortgage anymore, uh, leading you to have to sell the house. Now, if, the, if it happens that your property value is lower than the outstanding mortgage, uh, you have a bit of an issue there because uh, then you have remaining debt of your mortgage. And this is where NSG comes in. They will pay the remaining amount that's outstanding. So that's a very nice uh, situation there, of course. Now, this insurance situation, it is very nice because it gives you some security when you sell the house uh, uh, when you have to. Uh, but in the, in the end, that might not necessarily be the, the biggest thing why you would take it because it's also a, a discount on the interest rate. So if you buy a house for less than 355,000 euros, then you get a lower interest rate from, uh, from the bank in the end. Um, I almost hear the questions coming up already. So when it comes to this value of 355, um, that's the average selling price of last year, determined in November, uh, October, November usually. Um, and what this value means is uh, either if you buy for a property, so the purchase price or the value of the property. They don't necessarily have to be the same. Uh, we'll explain a bit more about that later on. Um, but uh, it's either the lowest. So that's in the end uh, the thing that we go for. So either the uh, purchase price of 355 or the value of 355. Now, if you go over that, you wouldn't be able to apply for that in, in any case. So if you buy something for 360, there's no part of your mortgage that could uh, apply for this NHG uh, uh, arrangement. So that's basically uh, how that works. If you want to know a bit more about your specific situation in this case, we can discuss that in a private solve, also, of course. That's uh, for later on. So that's it. Cool. Thanks very much for sharing. 
Um, then, well, a lot of people might have heard about, uh, about transfer tax, um, but just to explain a little bit what transfer tax is, it's the tax that you pay once ownership from a property is transferred from well, the seller to a buyer. Um, there are a few different rates of transfer tax. If we look at the um, a third column, that is the one that I think the majority knows. Um, if you uh, buy a property, you're both over 35 years old and a property, well, is in this example, 500k, but even if you're over 35 um, and the property is under 400k, both of you pay 2% transfer tax over your share of the property. So that will come down to Kate paying 2% over her 50% and John paying 2% transfer tax over his 50%, coming to a, a transfer tax of 2% of the purchase price. Now, we also have a transfer tax ex exemption, if we look all the way to the left. Um, in this example, we have Kate and John, who are both actually under 35 years old, and they are buying a property of 400k. Um, good to know is that 400k is the benchmark, or is the, uh, the, the max here. Um, but in this case, they don't have to pay any transfer tax. This is like a, a starter's um, exemption. Um, to, to create uh, more equal opportunities for, for people who are um, joining the housing market for the first time. Um, what does that mean? A transfer tax, both of 0%. Then we also have a example here in the middle. This is an example where Kate is 37 and John is 33. So Kate is over 35, John is under 35. Purchase price is again 400k. Um, in this case, Kate is paying 2% over her 50% share, and John is paying 0% over his 50% uh, share. What does that come down to? A 1% transfer tax in total. Um, then something that might not be too applicable um, here, but if you are buying purely for an investment point of view, then the transfer tax is a little bit higher and is actually 8% of the purchase price. So uh, good to keep that in mind if you are um, just buying to, to rent a property out. <clears throat> Did I miss anything here, Robin? Um, no, that's... I'm not on mute anymore, no? No, uh, no that's pretty much uh, it, correct? Uh, everything uh, is explained to perfection, really. Perfect, cool. So what is um, good to know, like I said before, the um, um, slides will be shared with you all. If you see in the right bottom, you see visit the transfer tax checker, you'll be able to click on that when you get the actual uh, slides. Um, so you'll be able to fill in some specifics about your situation, for example, uh, purchase price, age, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, there it will actually mention how much transfer tax you have to pay. Uh, sorry to, to interrupt you, uh, Ludo, maybe uh, of so a quick question uh, coming up and I thought, well, might just cover it right now. Um, if you're uh, under 35 and you, pay, uh, and you buy a home for over 400,000 euros, um, you pay 2% uh, over total amount. So even if you buy a house for 400,000 and one euro, you pay 2% uh, over the entire amount. Just a, it's a small uh, addition. Yeah, so the, the cap is indeed at 400. Um, the, the government sees it as if you are able to buy over 400, then you are therefore not per se a starter or someone that has uh, too much difficulty in, in entering the housing market. I wouldn't say I totally agree in the Amsterdam housing market, but <laughs> that's a discussion for something else, I think. <clears throat> Um, then we have a, another poll. I'm very curious where you are in the process. Um, let me see if I can start that. Yes, I can. <clears throat> so again, uh, take, a, take a few minutes to fill this in. Um, if you've already made an offer or if you've uh, just done, done uh, some viewings or even uh, just researching. <clears throat> so the majority is um, well, still in the research phase. It's a smart idea to join the webinar. Hopefully we can add some value there. And the majority hasn't spoken with a uh, buying agent or a mortgage broker yet. <clears throat> cool. So I will end the poll, share the results with you all so you can have a look. Well, I think we have a quite a even amount of um, people. Cool. Then, um, well. We are able to buy, we are able to rent, uh, but what are actually the pros and cons of renting and buying? Well, we'll start with renting. Uh, what would be the pros of, of renting a home? Well, first of all, you have flexibility, meaning that you can, um, depending on your contract, of course, but pretty easily 
um, um, quit your contract and move somewhere else. So if you are thinking of staying in the Netherlands for a year or two years, um, our advice is generally to, to, to rent because it's just a little bit, uh, gives you more flexibility. Besides that, there are no taxes or maintenance costs um, and there's no down payment required to um, uh, rent a property besides a first month uh, deposit. Uh, but securing a rental property is a lot cheaper than securing a buying, uh, buying home. Um, besides that, some cons of actually owning a home um, is that you indeed do have taxes, the maintenance costs are for you, and it's a little bit harder to move. Um, you first have to sell your property, uh, find a new property, there's a lot more involved in that. So uh, well, we, we hope you're still interested in buying a home, of course, um, and here are some reasons why you should buy a home. First of all, it gives you stability, right? Um, you are not dependent on, on high uh, more, or, uh, rental prices um, and uh, you are your own uh, land uh, or a homeowner. So um, no, um, um, what's it called? Uh, rental, um, <clears throat> well, rental owners, let's, let's say like that. Um, you don't have, or you're going to be uh, paying your monthly payments, but they are going to build up some equity. So it's not just um, a rent that you are drowning um, in the drain, but you are actually putting some money in your own pocket. And there is a mortgage interest deduction, of course. Um, there are also some cons of renting your home. Uh, rents will keep rising. The expected rise um, is, is not that little actually in the coming years. So um, because of that, um, yeah, the demand is, is getting up. Um, there are no tax benefits and there's no creation of wealth as you are again throwing all the rent away instead of putting it in your own pocket. Um, Robin, can you tell us a little bit about the financial situation when it comes to renting versus buying? Yeah, yeah. So uh, indeed, as, as Ludo already um, correctly mentioned, it really starts making sense to buy a property when you're uh, looking into to stay in the same property for the next, let's say, two, three, preferably three, four, five years. Uh, because then the investment that you do starts making sense. Now, when you compare two si uh, similar properties, um, you can see two different, uh, two similar properties here in the same street. Um, one uh, on the left, you can see uh, renting out uh, for 2,250 euros per month, you would have to pay. And on the right, you can see the asking price or the listing price was 525,000 euros. So if you would compare then the uh, rent to the mortgage that you would take out, you can see that there as well. So a mortgage for 525,000 euros with an interest rate of 0 0.58. Now this interest rates, they increase now a bit. Um, so I expect them to kind of stay level at around um, 1.9 or 2%. So that's uh, something we'll discuss later. But then your monthly payments for a mortgage would be 1,832. So when you compare the two, you can already see that with a similar property buying uh, on a monthly basis, it will be less expensive in the sense of your monthly payments. Now, the actual com uh, comparison that you should that you could make is the interest that you pay, because uh, again, what Ludo already mentioned, when you repay on your mortgage, so you take on a mortgage for 525 and you have to repay every month a bit, but that's essentially money that you put in your bricks, because if you sell it, then you get that money back. Now, the interest that you pay, that is money down the drain. Kind of similar to the rent that you would pay so if you compare these two you can see the interest payment in the first month with the mortgage is 691 whereas your uh, rent that you pay is still 2250 so that's already a significant difference now the good thing to keep in mind is when you buy a home there is an um, an, a closing fee so that's kind of an investment that you would do later on uh, Ludo will tell you a bit about more about what these closing fees are built out of. so then you have to see okay sure um I have a closing fees of approximately 23,000 euros. So when do I earn back this, um, uh, this investment when you compare it to? Now that's approximately 15 months to 18 months. Um, uh, so uh, that's, in, that's kind of the break even point when it starts really making sense to buy a home. Now, keep in mind that that's an investment you should build up a bit more uh, and then it starts making sense to really live in the property for two, three, four, five years. Now, can you see here as well uh, what happens with your mortgage? So in five years, you repaid your mortgage uh, to, um, uh, uh, to uh, with 71,000 euros. So that's kind of the money that you repaid on your house. So that's when you sell it, you would get that back again. So that's kind of also to show you what you would build up in equity in about five years in this specific situation. So it's a 
quite a nice amount for sure especially yeah. if you had some um, sell with some overvalue um, it can be a, it can be a smart move to, to actually yeah. buy a property and that sure. has been considered here even so this is just what you repay in your mortgage it hasn't been yeah. in included here that property values are expected to increase a bit as well so that could only uh, uh, that's expected to get more as well yeah for sure cool thank you so well um as you might have all heard, the, the prices are rising uh, and not with a small amount uh, either. Um, and what are some reasons for the uh, prices to increase? Well, first of all, there are quite some fiscal benefits at play currently. Um, one of them is the transfer tax exemption that I was talking about, meaning that it's a lot easier for people to uh, jump into the housing market while keeping their costs lower. Um, there's an interest debate. There are no capital gains from actually selling your property with um, a, um, a profit. Um, and it's ending at the end of this year, most likely, but there's still a tax-free parent donation, um, meaning that, uh, and I, I think it's not even just for a parent, it's a, it's a tax-free donation, um, but it's uh, up to 100k tax-free uh, donating, again, to make it more um, favorable or more uh, opportunistic for people to join the housing market. Besides that, uh, money is uh, relatively cheap currently, there are low interest rates, um, the uh, rents are high, meaning people are, um, yeah, the, the demand for purchase properties is higher. Uh, and on the other side of the balance, there's a lack of supply. Um, they are building very intensively, but um, uh, as you know, a property isn't built in a few weeks. It takes uh, a few years actually. So um, it's always lacking behind a little bit. Um, because of that, the, the prices are still um, expected to increase. I think the, the ABN AMRO came with a, a number of 12.5% for this year. Um, the, the steep of the increase is expected to go down next year. Um, the, the steep of the increase, so not the actual um, prices won't go down, but it will rise with a little bit less than uh, this year. Um, well, as we mentioned before, indeed, buying a home does cost money. Um, uh, unlike renting, you need to invest some of your own money to actually be able to purchase a home. Here we have some closing fees, as we call them. Well, first of all, the transfer tax that we talk about, um, generally 2%, unless, of course, you are uh, buying under 400k and are under 35 years old. Um, good to know is that if you are buying a new build project, you also don't have to pay transfer tax. You are then actually paying a VAT, which is included in the purchase price. Um, we have some notary costs. First of all, the mortgage deed, if you are taking out the mortgage, which I assume the uh, majority of you will do, depending on where you're buying and which notary you choose, it will be between 600 to 1100 euros um, for that deed. Same goes for the transfer deed. Um, something that will have to happen if you're taking out a mortgage or not, always need a transfer deed. Um, besides that, we have a, a bank or mortgage broker cost. Um, well, to, to go a little bit more in depth in here, uh, you can choose to go just with the bank. However, good to keep in mind is that a bank regularly offers you four to five products and will try to sell you only those four or five products. And then we have our um, mortgage magician, Robin, who has access to um, well, more than 35 mortgage lenders, which all have around three to five products that they can offer. So um, to get specific advice about your situation, we will always advise you to go with a mortgage broker um, as you will be able to find the best deal for your specific situation. Um, besides that, um, a typical real estate agent charges you about 1% to 2% of the purchase price, <clears throat> what I talked about before. In this case, there is an incentive to actually buy at a higher price because the real estate agent will also um, won't be able to catch some more cash on that. Um, like I mentioned, EHN charges a fixed fee, so for us that is not the case. We'll come back to our fees uh, a little bit later on. Um, if you do want a mortgage on your property, you will need to get the property appraised. Um, that's a, a fancy word for someone who will actually determine the value of the property. Um, will cost you around 550 to 600 euros. Technical inspector, always something we recommend. A person who comes in after the offer is accepted. Well, now I actually uh, um, uh, answered something while we have a question about that later on. So um, <laughs> lucky you all. But um, a technical inspector will come in indeed after the offer is accepted to check uh, if the property is in good condition. If you do not speak the Dutch language um, uh, well, at, a, at a B level, then um, you will need an interpreter there at the notary. Um, costs are generally 250 euros. Um, 
when buying a property, you will have to make a deposit. We'll come back to that a little bit later on, um, but that is uh, typically 10% of the purchase price. You can also choose to go for a bank guarantee, and that is when a bank actually covers the deposit amount. Um, and the costs are between 250 euros and 1% of the guaranteed amount. Um, and the NHG, of course, that we talked about. So if you will be taking out a mortgage with the NHG, um, they will charge you a one-time fee of 0.6% of the mortgage amount. Of course, in return, you will get some nice deducted interest rates. Now, as you see in the um, most right column, there are some costs that are tax deductible. And if you look closely, it's actually all the costs that are related to a mortgage. Um, as the uh, government well, uh, understands that you need to take a mortgage out for a property and want to uh, incentivize that a little bit, they have made all those costs tax deductible. So that is the mortgage deed, not the transfer deed, but just the mortgage deed, a bank or mortgage broker, um, the appraiser, and the NHG, if you choose to move forward with the NHG. Cool. Then, um, well, we're all here because we want to buy a property, so we might, um, it might be a good idea to share some tips to actually win a property in the current market. First of all, value, value, value. What does that mean? Is that um, a property uh, that you see on Funda uh, might be listed at 395. And before I move forward, good to know is that currently there's no real correlation between the asking price and the market value. Um, what does that mean? We have here around three, yeah, three values that are of importance. We have the asking price, the market value and the purchase price. Well, preferably we'll have all the three uh, values at the same amount. Um, that would make uh, our lives a little bit easier, but unfortunately that is not the case. As you can see, the asking price is actually lower than the market value. I get a lot of questions of people asking why would they list a property lower than the market value? Um, biggest reasons for that is that the selling agent um, can get a little bit more people into the property and more viewings means more offers. On the other hand, they can also uh, share with their uh, selling client uh, that they, they sold the property for much more than uh, they listed it at, while actually the listing price was lower than the market value. So it's a little bit of a trick on that side as well. Um, but to show you um, the difference between the asking price and the purchase price in this example is 10%. And that is of course what you hear um, in the news and what you will hear from uh, friends, colleagues who have also purchased a house. But actually, if you look closely, the overbid in this case was on, only with brackets, of course, but only 4.8%, because that's the difference between the market value and the purchase price. Now, what also happens is that, for example, a property is listed at 375 instead of 395. Market value is still the same, purchase price is also the same. Then, all of a sudden, we have an overbid of 16%. Still, the overbid over market value is 4.8%. So this is why it's very important to know the market value. And this is, of course, something that we offer within um, uh, Expert Housing Network. So before we make an offer, we want to determine the market value. So we know what the actual price is where we think um, the, the market value is and what we think a, a competitive offer would be. Um, value, value, value. Keep it in mind. Besides that, um, the funny thing is, uh, uh, submitting a winning offer is not as easy as it sounds and it doesn't always have to be the highest offer. There are a few things that come into play. Uh, first of all, indeed offering a good price. What do I mean with that is that um, uh, if you make an offer with 100% uh, finance, which is far higher than the market value, most likely an appraiser will not appraise it at that value. So um, even if you are able to spend it from a mortgage cap perspective, if the appraisal will not, uh, or appraiser will not appraise it, the property at the amount that you offered at, the bank will not give you that amount. And therefore making a good offer is um, sometimes more attractive for the sellers than actually making the highest offer. Um, besides that, I mentioned it just now as well, uh, offer security to the seller. Um, that has to do with uh, the financial clause. Of course, there are risks attached to it, but uh, a financial clause is a clause that you put in the offer um, saying, hey, if I cannot get a mortgage approved, then I'm not obligated to move forward with the purchase. Um, how I normally explain it, there is this thing called risk. It's either at the buyer or at the seller. If we put in a financial clause, then um, you are taking the risk away from the buyer, but therefore have to put the risk on the plate of the seller. Um, and as we mentioned before, it's quite a seller's market, quite a chaotic market, and therefore we have to make our offer as attractive as we can. So with the help of uh, Robin, we'll try to take out the financial clause, um, and therefore we, well, 
take the risk away from the seller and we do put it in uh, on our plate. Of course, we have some tricks to mitigate the risk there to make sure we get the appraisal amount before we actually sign the purchase agreement and, and some other tricks. Um, but that is a way to offer security to the seller. Um, besides that, uh, we want to offer the least amount of hassle. Well, there, um, what we mean with that is that you can put as many clauses in the purchase agreement and the offer as you'd like, um, but the least amount of, of um, clauses means the more attractive the, uh, the offer is. For example, the technical inspection clause, something we do put in the offer in Amsterdam pretty much every time because the properties are so old, but if you are buying a property that is 10 years old, um, you can easily take out the technical inspection clause because it just creates more hassle. And besides that, believe it or not, adding a personal touch to the offer also um, offers um, some or adds uh, some um, added value. Um, there are a lot of people who are now selling their properties who actually don't want to sell to an investor or to someone who's just going to flip it quickly, uh, but they want to sell their property to a, for example, young family who will start a new life there or an expat who just moved here and is uh, ready to discover the Netherlands. So if you share that with the seller and you share your story, um, it definitely adds value there as well. Cool. Then we have due diligence. Well, we have um, a person called the technical inspector and the appraiser. Well, I, I have I told you guys a little bit about this before, but we have a question for you. Do you think you book the appraiser and the technical inspection before you make the offer or after you make the offer? And I'd like to ask you to share this in the chat just to see um, what you guys think and I'll be sharing the answer in 30 seconds or so. <clears throat> So I hear a, a lot of uh, afters coming in, but also some befores. Uh, we have a mix, mixed crowd here. Nice. <clears throat> so I want to uh, keep you in suspense uh, much longer. Um, the sweet spot is actually right here. And that is just, um, just after the offer is accepted. Now, why is that the case? As we saw before, the appraiser costs money and the technical inspector costs money. Um, and both of them combined around a thousand euros. Um, if we have to get them in every time before we make an offer, the cost can, can get quite high um, because it might not be the case that we get an offer accepted the first time. So if we make three offers and have to get them in three times before we make an offer, that's just pretty much 3000 euros down the drain. So um, definitely something we want to avoid. Of course, we do want to get them in as soon as possible, meaning that if the offer is accepted today, today is a Thursday, um, I definitely want to request the technical inspector and the appraiser uh, latest tomorrow so that they can come in next week, Monday, um, because we want to have the reports in before we sign the purchase agreement. Uh, typically, the, the time between getting an offer accepted and actually signing the purchase agreement, it's one and a half weeks. Um, and the thing is, in the Netherlands, if you don't sign the purchase agreement, you're actually not legally obligated to move forward with the purchase as well. Meaning that if you get the technical inspection report back and all of a sudden the house seems like it's in a very, very bad condition, um, we can do a few things. Of course, we can go and debate with the uh, sellers and say, hey, fix this before we move in. Uh, but something else that you can do is just say, uh, we didn't expect anything like this. We want to pull out. And within that one and a half weeks, there are no... Um, yeah, financial obligations or penalties like that. Um, so that is that is the sweet spot to do it. <clears throat> um, then a general timeline. You just saw a, a bit of a smaller part of the timeline, but uh, good to know the the general timeline. So um, I think you all can see my mouse. We'll start the search here. Um, this is a period depending on how many few viewings you want to do, how many competitive offers um, we can do and want to do. At one point, we'll get the offer um, approved and accepted. Then uh, right here is what we were talking about before. We'll request the appraisal and uh, technical inspection. They'll come into the house um, and draft up the technical report and the appraisal report. We'll share this with Robin, and then we'll go to the notary to sign the purchase agreement. Uh, good to know is that it depends a little bit on where you're buying a property. In Amsterdam, we'll always go to the notary. Uh, but if you're buying in the region where Katie is situated in Rotterdam, Den Haag, then the um, uh, purchase agreements are actually drafted up by the selling agent. Um, once we sign the purchase agreement, that is when uh, Robin can press the big green mortgage application button. We'll need the uh, purchase agreement and the appraisal report to actually re um, apply for that and some additional documents, of course. Um, 
but that is when the uh, the mortgage application starts. Good to know, by the way, the, the orange um, dot here is that between the time that you, uh, or from the moment that you sign the purchase agreement, you have three days so-called cooling off period um, to pull out of the purchase agreement without giving any reason. This is just to prevent um, buyers from moving into a contract um, too soon. Um, so you'll still have three days after signing the purchase agreement to, to change your mind without giving any reason. If that time is passed, then um, yeah, you are attached to the contract. Um, and that is also when the, the mortgage application is in full go. Um, on average, this takes four weeks. However, um, again, Magician Robin can do it um, much quicker. I would say generally two to three weeks, right? Something like that. Yeah, depending on the, on the situation, obviously, and how busy the banks are, it's uh, one week we can do even well when well, all the stars align. Uh, but then yeah. it needs two or three weeks is, is, a, is a better time to, to consider. Uh, definitely not four or five, six weeks. You might hear from banks, but I honestly don't really know what they do with the remaining time. It's just that we want to give you uh, security as soon as possible, of course. Perfect. Well, another uh, reason to move forward with this mortgage, I see. Um, then hopefully uh, the mortgage application is approved, of course. And then depending on um, when you have this or what date you have decided on with the sellers, you'll move towards the transfer date. Um, around a week or two before the transfer happens, you'll get the statement of completion. Again, a fancy word for final invoice from the notary. Um, this invoice will have the purchase costs on there, transfer tax, the notary cost. Actually, our costs will be on there. Mr. Mortgage costs will be on there. Um, so you'll be paying in one go to the notary and they, they, they will distribute the money accordingly. Um, before we go to the notary, we'll have a final inspection. This is just to double check the property is still in the same state as agreed upon when signing the uh, purchase agreement. Then we'll go to the notary, we'll sign the transfer deed and most likely the mortgage deed. You'll get the keys and then it is champagne time. Um, we'll have two months, which is a so-called liability term. This is a term where if um, yeah, things uh, break in the house or um, don't work as they should or have been agreed upon, you can still go back to the sellers and say, hey, um, I see that the window op uh, doesn't open like it should. Um, can you please come fix this? That is a, around a two month period. However, it is a little bit of a gray area. So um, we as EHN are also there to support during that process, of course. Cool. Then we have reached the frequently asked questions. Well, I think this is a moment where, where Katie um, is, is going to shine and help us out. Great. So I left some uh, questions unanswered specifically because they're a, a little bit more uh, detailed, let's say. Uh, so I thought it would be useful for everyone. So I'm going to go back to them, guys. If there's a question that you notice that I missed, please uh, point it out again. Uh, the first question, I was just answering this to Jane, but I guess now uh, Robin can answer that. Do we get a 4.5 uh, times 4.5 of our yearly salary of the mortgage? Um, that's a very, 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 very rough calculation. Uh, sure, it's it's in that in that area, but in the end, uh, what makes a very big difference is not only that, because you have to know exactly what your income is. Now, obviously, you can see that on your salary slip, but uh, have it checked by a financial specialist because um, you have a holiday allowance. You have to check if that's included there. Maybe you, um, you work at the same company for some time. You received a bonus over the last couple, uh, couple of years or and it might be a kind of a benefit budget, depending on the lender, we can include that to a certain extent as well. So, or you have a provision because you're in sales, all these different variables are good to keep in mind um, to see what part of your uh, income can be used for mortgage and then uh, and, uh, four, uh, four or five times. It's still a bit hard because it also depends on how high your income is and what interest rates you have, because then a certain percentage can vary in different scenarios there. So sure, it's a very rough calculation. Don't start bidding based on that. Um, that's just my, my main advice there. Yeah, we also uh, had a client before that they had a, a mobile abonnement that they forgot to mention. So that really affected their yeah. Yeah. mortgage yeah. cap. So yeah. Make sure you go to Robin, guys, before you make yep. any. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Uh, and then another one for you, Robin. Uh, if if someone was to purchase a house for under 400K as a residential mortgage, but then after some years, they want to ch change uh, the mortgage from buy to buy to let, 
Yep. What would be the tax transfer there? Do they still need to pay the 8% or not? Um, so it's first off, good to keep in mind uh, or to understand what transfer tax means. Um, transfer tax is charged by the tax authorities, obviously, when there's a transfer of ownership. So when party one transfer the ownership to party two, buying or selling, that is. So when you have the property and you pay 2% because you are going to live in it, you use it as a residential uh, 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 property, and then in a couple of years you turn it into a buy-to-let property, then the property is still yours. So there's no transfer tax um, uh, in play there. So uh, no, no transfer tax in any case. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Ludo, I have a question for you. Um, after how many years we can sell the apartment and buy something bigger? Is there something we should consider? Are there any related costs with that? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, definitely depends on your, your personal situation, of course. I think uh, some good things to keep in mind is that um, buying a home costs money, right? So um, you have your initial uh, investment. Um, that you'll be doing, which can, well, can go up into high numbers, meaning that if you sell again after um, a year or a year and a half, uh, it might be that a the market value hasn't risen with uh, uh, quite a substantial amount. Plus, um, you might have spent, for example, the thirty thousand euros or so on, on buying a home, and if you uh, need to do that again for another property uh, within a year and year and a half. Um, it can be quite an expensive, uh, expensive hobby to, to switch homes uh, like that. Uh, but technically speaking, um, just from a, a lawful point of view, you can buy a home today and sell it again tomorrow. Um, but if that is the smartest move, then um, I, I don't know if that, uh, that is totally advisable. But yeah, it, it is definitely possible. Uh, Katie, by the way, uh, shall we move forward first with the frequently asked questions um, that we have on the screen, and then we'll move on with the uh, with the complete Q and A, yeah, so we can uh, do that. spend the total time. Great. Uh, then the first question would be: Can I get a mortgage with a temporary contract or as a freelancer? Uh, I guess I'll take that. Uh, yes. Um, it can be a very short answer, but to give you a bit detail here, uh, let's first look at the temporary contract. Sure, you can. Uh, best thing is that you covered your, your probation period, first thing. So that's, a, that's an important thing. And then usually, uh, because otherwise we probably wouldn't be able to close mortgage on this specific situation, sure. Uh, but temporary contract covered your probation period. Then the thing is, what, you, what we need is an employer statement. There's a confirmation from your employer what exactly, what, who you are, uh, what, what, property, uh, what um, uh, uh, company you work for, uh, what kind, kind of contract you have, and what your income is. With your contract, it states also till when. So when it states an end date there, the, uh, uh, your employer can also give you a declaration of intent. There's another box to tick. And they then confirm, well, if you do a good job and our financial situation of the company stays as strong as it is right now, then we are intending to give you a permanent contract after this term ends. It's an intention. It's not legally binding to the, to the employer. So there's not really any reason why they wouldn't give you um, this declaration of intent. When you have that, we can go crazy on your, on your mortgage, essentially. Now, we will check with you, of course, if this is also something that you intend to do, because if you say, okay, sure, I'll uh, work, uh, live out my uh, contract and then I'll go uh, travel the world and never to earn anything anymore, sure, then it might not necessarily be the best thing to buy a house. So we'll look at the documentation, but definitely also your uh, personal situation. So yes, temporary contract uh, uh, on the conditions, it's definitely possible there. When it comes to being a freelancer, yes, it's also possible. You might read on the internet that you need at least three years of history of your company. That's not necessarily true. Uh, one year, 12 months, to be more sp specific, that's already sufficient to, to uh, base a mortgage on. Uh, again, um, there are different specific situations here. So by all means, uh, check in with a financial specialist or check in with uh, uh, through an introductory call with us to see what your situation is and what the possibilities are. Great. Thank you very much. Moving to the next question, what happens if you want to leave the country after several years? Uh, I guess, Ludo, you can answer this one for us. Yeah, sure. So, um, well, there are, generally speaking, three things um, that you can do. Uh, first of all, 
keep your home, right? Um, just keep your keep your property here uh, as a nice vacation home. Not that the weather is always so nice, but you can definitely uh, do so. Um, and the only thing you'll you'll keep are your mortgage costs in that case. Um, no penalties from not actually living here or anything like that. Uh, it is um, fine to keep your home like it is. Um, a second is, um, and that is, I, I guess, in addition to the first one, um, is the possibility to rent out your home. Um, that would mean that the um, majority of your mortgage costs will most likely be covered by your tenant. However, good to keep in mind is that you cannot just randomly move or rent out your property. You will need permission from your bank. Um, and banks are not the most flexible when it comes out to, to renting your property. Um, besides the fact that you will most likely need to get a buy to let mortgage. Uh, where your interest rates are higher, you will also need to have paid off at least a certain amount of your property already, or need to add a, a cash amount to be able to rent out to your property. Um, do ask permission from your bank, because if they do find out that you didn't ask permission and you're renting out your property, the penalties can um, become substantial. And that's definitely something that you uh, want to avoid. Um, then we have a third option. If you want to move out of the country, you can, of course, always sell your home and there is no penalty or capital gains tax uh, there either. Um, so in that sense, it's quite attractive to buy a home for a few years. Um, for, and with a few years, we mean three to four or five years. And then sell again if you have plans to move out, move out of the country again or start an adventure in a, in a different country. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, then the next question would be, can I rent out my house or a room, Ludo? Yeah, so I think it's a well, a two part. I think I'll answer half of it and, uh, and Robin will be answer, um, uh, answering half of it as well. Um, yes, it is possible. Um, just like we mentioned in the previous question, it is definitely possible, um, especially renting out part of your house. So in this case, a room. Um, Generally, you don't need to have permission from your bank to actually rent out a room or something like that. Advisable is to put some um, um, things in, in writing together with your, your roommate in this case, uh, but you don't actually need a full rental agreement with that person either. Um, you'll just be sh sharing the costs or you will come up with a, a rental amount and you can definitely have a, a tenant in your, in your property. Um, but and then I'm looking at you, Robin. I think rent, renting out your house is a little bit uh, has a little bit more eyes and catches there. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. So um, when you rent out a room, indeed, it doesn't necessarily have to be an issue. You could have a roommate. Um, uh, that, that's perfectly fine. Um, now make sure that uh, when when somebody rents out uh, rents a, a room in your in your house and they live there for a specific time, then at some point in time, they will get certain rights and you cannot just pick them when you want to sell the house. So make sure that that's covered indeed in the in the contract that you uh, don't have to sell your house with your roommate still in there. Um, so that's one thing, um, rent out your entire house. Um, this is when you, when you buy a property for your own personal residence, you close a residential mortgage as well. So it can, you can call it that. So it's for the purpose of living it in yourself. So these banks are quite specific about that, that they don't want you to rent out the entire home because that's not what the in, uh, uh, mortgage was intended for. And that has something to do with their res risk assessment and the interest rate. So indeed the interest rates are a bit higher, but mostly the maximum mortgage that you can take out is lower. So if you want to rent out your entire house, um, you have to refinance your property. So it has to be changed from a residential mortgage into an investment mortgage. Definitely possibilities there as well. Um, check in again uh, what it means for you. Uh, but there are definitely possibilities to have it rented, uh, to rent out your entire house, but make sure that your mortgage is refinanced. Great, thanks for that. Next one would be what impact will COVID have on the market, uh, on the housing market, and of course, on the mortgage market? I guess this is a 50-50 question. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So I'll, I'll kick off. Um, I think we should actually change this question to what impact did COVID have as we're already um, two years further on. And uh, we got some good news in the beginning of this week uh, that uh, a lot of stuff is opening up again. So definitely looking forward to that. Um, but when we look at the housing market um, in the beginning of 2020, we saw that uh, there was indeed a little dip. People got scared, didn't know what was going to happen. And therefore it froze a little bit, not a lot of transactions. People weren't so keen on selling, but also not so keen on buying. 
Um, but funny enough, uh, people started working from home and um, we saw, I think after three months, four months already that the market started going up again and not with a little bit either. Um, and, and what I mentioned, uh, people started work from home. That means that um, people were spending almost 24 seven in their homes and started appreciating or actually not appreciating their house as they did before. Um, they needed more space. They wanted more outside space. Um, like an, uh, inside an office or something like that. And therefore uh, started thinking about what their house meant for them actually. Uh, because of this, there were uh, all of a sudden a lot of transactions happening, a lot of people selling their property, but even more people um, looking for a, a new uh, property. We saw also uh, quite a switch from people moving from, uh, for example, the city center of Amsterdam to uh, places like Zandam, Almere, where um, you have a little bit more space um, for a relatively lower uh, price. Um, and um, at one point, expats started moving uh, moving back to, to the Netherlands as well. There was a, a little bit of a hold, uh, but I think already in um, well, September of 2020, beginning of uh, 2021, um, the, the, the flow started happening again. Because of this, um, prices started rising um, um, intensively and, well, to be honest, haven't stopped rising either. Um, so I think that that is the majority um, of the impact that COVID had on the housing market. Um, and I think the impact that it had on the housing market is slowing down now a little bit and that we're coming back to somewhat of a, um, yeah, I wouldn't say normal, but uh, before COVID times, let's say. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, when it comes to um, uh, to the mortgages and uh, the mortgage market in that sense, um, we expected a larger impact there. Um, when it just hit, so let's say March 2020, uh, we saw a slight increase in the interest rate, uh, but there was a very minute increase of 0 .0, 0, uh, 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 maybe, but then that returned to the uh, uh, same level again quite quickly. Um, so there didn't really didn't really happen a lot. The only thing that happened really is that we saw that banks were a bit more skittish to supply mortgage within it to everybody because then um, obviously the, uh, the job market was a bit under stress as well. So what's going to happen uh, is there are there going to be reorganizations, of course, layoffs. Um, so that's what uh, banks did want to know, just the reassurement that you actually keep your uh, job. So this declaration of intent got a bit more intensified well not really uh, a lot and definitely nothing to worry about uh, because that uh, pretty much returned to normal um so that's uh, pretty much the, the the impact that COVID had in the end and indeed prices uh, property values increased partially due also to a low interest rate so it was easy to borrow money it is easy to borrow money so therefore people get more uh, are tending to get a higher mortgage so therefore they can spend more if they can spend more sellers will ask more so that's kind of the, how the market worked in that sense. So uh, a lot more uh, impact of COVID uh, or the COVID situation hasn't really been there uh, uh, to my mind. Luckily, <laughs> good thing. Next one, what is the 10% deposit that I need to complete? Ludo, can you answer this for us? I can for sure. So I think we have a nice timeline um, over here as well. So we'll just move. Um, it's good to see the whole timeline. Um, so indeed, there's a 10% deposit that needs to be paid um, in uh, contrast to, for example, the US or, or other countries. Um, the deposit is always 10%. So also if you have more cash available, it doesn't per se increase the, uh, the, the favorability to say I can make a higher deposit or, or anything like that because the deposit will pretty much always be 10%. Um, and you pay a deposit, of course, to offer security to the sellers because you start the mortgage application here, um, you get the mortgage approved here, but actually generally a week after that is when you make the deposit to already yeah, give security to the sellers and say, um, you know, if anything happens after the mortgage is approved and I still want to, to pull out or anything like that, um, I will be able to pay uh, the penalty that is described in the purchase agreement. Uh, by the way, a little bit off topic, but good to know is that if you pull out out of the purchase agreement without a dissolving clause that allows you to do so, you have to pay a 10% penalty um, to the sellers sellers also to the buyers, by the way, if they decide to do so. Um, the deposit is pretty much an insurance there for the sellers to say, I can actually pay this amount. No, 
we understand that uh, not everyone has 10% uh, of the purchase price laying around on their bank account. So that is the, the bank guarantee that we were talking about before, a um, um, you know, sort of insurance for the bank that says, okay, we will cover the 10% deposit um, in the name of our client if um, something happens during the purchase of the property. Um, that is generally what the 10% what the uh, deposit is. Um, not much more than that, just regularly, I would say a week or two weeks after the mortgage application is approved is when you would make the deposit, um, either in cash or in a bank guarantee. If you do it in cash, then of course, in the statement of completion that we have here, we will have some things that still need to be paid and that have already been paid. And it might be the case that if your deposit is higher than the amount that you still need to pay, then you get some money back at the end as well. So it really is a deposit, uh, but it will be used as a, um, as a cost, that cost will be deducted from that as well. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, and a little bit more about uh, what are your fees? Yep, so um, well, I'll kick off with this one. Um, always good to know, right? Our uh, buying services, we actually offer, well, generally two packages, but uh, since a few months now, we also have a third package, the new build package. Uh, but if you are looking for a uh, already built property, then we either have the smart package and the complete package. Difference between the two is that within the uh, complete package, we are actually there to book the viewings for you, and attend the viewings, and we will also attend the third party meetings. So the technical inspector, notary, final inspection, and notary again. With the smart package, it's a little bit more of an independent uh, remote consultant kind of thing, where you book the viewings, you attend the viewings, and we as EHN kick in at the moment that you want to make an offer. So of course, we still do the property document review, the price research, and all that. Um, but when you need to go to the notary or the technical inspection, I will only be on standby, but not actually join you to those meetings. So for people that um, don't have all the, the time of the world and are totally new to buying a, a property, uh, the complete package might be something for you. If you have already bought an endless amount of properties in your home country, know what it's like and have time to do it, then the smart package might be something for you. Um, and indeed, if you are looking for a new build project or a new build uh, property, then the new build package um, is more your thing. Um, the process is a little bit different and therefore there are also some different uh, yeah, check marks and, and uh, costs involved. How about you, Robin? Yes, um, so these are indeed, our, our, well, they used to be our fees uh, and they, uh, they essentially they are, but uh, we have something to celebrate uh, as of uh, uh, last week on Monday, we have an anniversary in, the, in Mr. Mortgage, so we have a, a significant discount right now, so uh, we'll uh, take your benefit there. Um, how we work is indeed we have um, when we refinance uh, properties, so when you have a residential mortgage and want to turn it into a buy to let or the other way around really. Um, we have a fixed fee of 2,500 euros. Uh, when it comes to the first time home buyer or uh, when you move home, so it doesn't necessarily, essentially when you buy a home, it's 3,250. And what you got for that um, is that we guide you through the whole process. So first off, we'll start with the financial analysis. Um, we do charge a, a small down payment for that of 299 euros just to get things started. And then uh, you know exactly what your range is. Uh, we'll discuss, we'll take time to really dive into the basics of a mortgage. Um, uh, the process uh, we'll uh, touch on again, just to refresh your memory after this call, of course. Um, and we'll discuss what, what kind of input of savings uh, do you need and make sense. Does it make sense to input more of your personal savings if you have it available? Uh, essentially, just making you all ready to dive into this housing market um, and you know exactly what you can get. Not only that, also during the whole house hunting process, we always keep close contact with uh, uh, the guys from Expert Housing Network. Um, so when there's a property that you like, just send us a listing and we'll revise these calculations again. So every time you do a viewing, you know exactly when, before you do that, you already know that you can close a mortgage and to what extent and what would that mean for your financial situation. It gives you the confidence to just make a quick decision if you have to, because as pretty much everybody knows now, this housing market you have to make a quick decision sometimes and we'd like to uh, you to be able to do that um, that goes for uh, when you buy a residential house but also when you buy a buy to let house same thing applies really now this is uh, everything for when you buy a house for under 1 million when you go over 1 million uh, banks tend to be a bit more fussy about it strangely um, it makes kind of sense because it's a larger amount that you borrow so they want to know they want to do a bit more extensive checks 
uh, we prepare that, of course. So then our fixed fee is three thousand uh, three hundred and uh, three thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine. That's a tongue twister. Um, so um, I mentioned before we have a, a celebration now, and we have a, um, a discount. That's a quite significant discount because we uh, give everybody a five hundred euros discount on this um, uh, on these charges on these fees. Wow. Um, so I mentioned before we have a down payment of two ninety nine. That's already obviously already part of this cost as well. And then at the very end, um, only when we get you to the notary, you pay us the remaining amount. And that's also on a no cure not pay base. So if we cannot get you there, you don't have to pay us. I'm comfortable in saying that because we did our due research, so we know we can get you there. So no worries there. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much it. And oh, by the way, our fee is tax deductible. So just another another benefit from the tax authorities. Exactly. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, our costs aren't, as the government apparently thinks that uh, <laughs> buying agents aren't that necessary. But uh, well, we'll get there. One day. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Well, um, thanks very much. We will definitely go over all the um, questions that have uh, are still unanswered. Uh, but before we do so, um, I'd love to well, know how you actually experienced the uh, webinar. So again, we'll launch a, a small poll. Um, please feel free to fill in um, your exp experience um, if you missed anything, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and if you did miss anything, uh, feel free to also share this in the chat what you would like to get some more information about. Um, and otherwise, um, um, yeah, feel free to fill it in. We see some nice scores coming in. That is always nice to see. Perfect. Thanks very much. All right, cool. Then we're going to end the poll and move on to the Q&A. All right, Katie. <laughs> Great. So there are quite a few questions here. Um, we've answered a few before, and we have answered a few um, in the uh, general questions. So I'm just going to go ahead with what's left. Um, we have a question from Delphine. Uh, wait, sorry, uh, my screen just uh, slide, so I lost the question. Uh, there it is. Is it better to aim for a higher mortgage and uh, um, uh, aim, uh, own equity or the other way around? Uh, I guess I'll, I'll take that. Um, right now, uh, essentially what it means is that you uh, either do or do not input your personal savings. Um, purely from the financial logic, it doesn't really make sense to input a lot of your personal savings right now because essentially the interest rate is quite low so let's say it's around 1.8 to 2 percent right now um the inflation is higher so in, in the end if you input more of your personal savings you kind of lose money over uh, over that so that in that case it doesn't really make sense and if anything that savings that you would input you could put it to better uh, use than than that there are better ways to invest really um, that's the financial logic but it could also be that you have a certain amount in monthly payments that you feel comfortable with. If you then turn out to buy a house that's more expensive than that monthly payment that you feel comfortable with allows you to, then it could make sense to kind of reduce that to uh, with your personal savings to uh, make you more comfortable with monthly payments. That's essentially it. So there's not necessarily a 100% right and wrong because it's also your personal view on your Okay, great. Thanks for the answer. Uh, we have another one for you. Um, does the mortgage service helps to get a good interest rate? And are, uh, are in general the interest rates ever negotiable? Um, so, there, no, it's not negotiable. Um, and if anything, uh, sure, I don't want to shoot myself in the foot here, but uh, you could do it yourself. That's definitely true. But the only thing is that uh, the majority of the banks that are out there right now, they don't necessarily work directly with consumers. So with, with um, uh, buyers themselves right away. They usually prefer to have an intermediary present there as well. So only the larger banks, um, they offer the service that you can go there directly. You can go to a branch and say, well, hey, I want a mortgage. I want to do this. 
So their services usually a bit lacking and they just have a way less uh, choice, of course, and they don't necessarily have to give you the best conditions and the best interest rate because people will go there anyway. So they don't really have an incentive to give you the best deal. And this is where it comes in that definitely working with an intermediary, a financial advisor, allows you to get a lower interest rate, not because we negotiate, because we have the, uh, the, the contacts and also the expertise to get you there. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Lulu, we have a question for you. I'm not sure if this is specifically related to Amsterdam or in the Netherlands uh, in general, maybe you can uh, give two answers. Uh, which areas are interesting to buy uh, a property now? Yeah, that is, um... That's a, that's a very good question. It depends on um, a lot of variables, of course. So what you're, I think most specifically, what you um, prefer in a house. Um, within Amsterdam um, itself, my advice would be to look a little bit towards the ring of Amsterdam, um, if not a little bit outside of the ring, just because the return on investment is going to be much larger there. Um, Amsterdam is becoming bigger with every day. There are some new plans to expand the ring um, and to make the well, entire residential part of Amsterdam bigger, meaning that the city center, for example, the pipe for people that are uh, familiar with Amsterdam, the, the, the peak is pretty much reached. Whereas if you are looking in north or new west, um, newer parts of east, uh, but also about to Felder, those places are, are definitely interesting to still uh, buy a property and get a nice return on investment after a few years. Um, generally in the Netherlands, I think it would be the same for, for every major city uh, where the, the city centers are reaching their peaks and the uh, rise is, not, is expected not to uh, get much higher than it is. Um, the suburbs are going to be included into those cities more and more over the coming years. Um, and the funny thing is, actually, while uh, the Amsterdam prices are, for example, very, very high, the biggest increase in prices is happening in places like Groningen, um, Drenthe, and northern parts of, of uh, the Netherlands. Um, so if you are looking purely to make a, make, um, a nice return on investment in three or five years, then I would say discover the northern parts of, Amps, or of uh, the Netherlands because they are expected to rise more even than uh, places like Amsterdam, Rotterdam or Utrecht. Great. I hope that answers the question a little bit. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's very conclusive. And if not, just uh, pop a question in the chat and we'll go over it again. Uh, what are the main differences in buying uh, in the buying process uh, of an existing versus a new build, Ludo? Yeah, good question. Um, so there's there's quite some differences when it comes to buying a um, well, existing build. You know what you're buying, right? So you can go to a viewing. Um, you can ask all the questions you want at the selling agent. Um, from there on, you make an offer. You do a technical inspection. You get it appraised. Uh, mortgage application time, and then you go back to uh, the property to pretty much get the keys. That's uh, um, there are some steps in between, but that is generally what the timeline looks like. Okay. Uh, with sorry. Sorry, sorry. I thought oh, yeah. we were done with that. No. So with the with the new build property, um, it's a little bit different because you are buying a a project, um, and you're buying something that hasn't or is not built yet. So that means that, first of all, you are going to be signing a letter of intent, meaning that you are intending to, to buy the property. From there on, you'll be depending on the uh, kind of project, but uh, a lot of times it's, it's a so-called co-development project, meaning that you will actively, with all the other uh, potential buyers, decide what the building uh, from the inside will look like, what kind of materials will be used, um, if solar panels are added, things like that. Of course, the actual building will be decided by the architect, but you will definitely have a big role in, in co-developing the building from the inside. Um, from there on, if, if major decisions have been made, everyone will sign a purchase agreement. Um, and from that moment on, a, a mortgage can be applied or can be, um, uh, uh, can be well, requested, let's say. Um, and then it is a, a very long time of actually uh, building the property, I would say on average two years, uh, but we see now that with the Corona, uh, with the COVID crisis happening, that actually a lot of building materials are going up, um, a lot of people are sick at home, and therefore these times are, are being delayed, 
And if you look at a, a purchase agreement from a new build property, there are very big um, yeah, um, marks from um, building the property in, in 300 days or in, in 800 days. And they can pretty much um, do either one without having too big of a penalties. Um, and again, in that period, you'll be in contact with the developer, with the architect to arrange uh, the position of the kitchen, what kind of kitchen, what kind of bathroom. So there's, uh, there's a lot more time and energy going into it. Um, but at the end, you will definitely have a, a property that is specific to your needs and exactly how you want it. That is when it comes to process wise. Um, money wise, there are also some differences uh, when buying an existing build, um, you will most likely need to overbid um, and there are different kinds of closing fees attached to it. When it comes to um, a new build property, you are not paying transfer tax, you're paying VAT, which is included in the purchase price. And besides that, um, you pay the asking price. So there's no overbidding on new build uh, properties. Um, you just pay the asking price. Uh, you can imagine that there those kinds of projects are quite popular and therefore they are also depending a little bit on what kind of project you're looking at either you'll go into a kind of lottery thing or it's first come first serve i would say those are the the biggest um, yeah, differences within the, the process great and uh, there's another question related to the um the pickup process for candidates for new builds mm -hmm. uh, the question is from igor uh, what is the approximate percentage uh, for those that require you to go through a lottery? Uh, what I understand uh, from this would be how many from the developers out there do require the lottery. Um, Igor, if this is not what you mean, please let us know and we can answer the question properly. Yeah, it's, um, uh, it depends totally um, on, on who the developers are and what they expect the interest will be. Um, if you're looking more towards a higher range, 800K up, there's not really a lottery, then it's just uh, people who can afford it and uh, first come, first serve. Uh, but when we look at uh, properties in the range between 300 and 500K, then normally it's you have to register yourself and then it's um, a lucky shot to actually get the property. Um, I couldn't specifically put a percentage on it because there are too many variables at play, I think. But um, uh, yeah, it, it depends on your specific situation. My advice is always if you find a new build property that you are interested in, um, don't take too long. Just register yourself to the property and make sure that they know you are interested. You'll get some additional information. Sometimes you'll get uh, invited at the selling agent's office to, to receive more information, but at least you're registered as a potential interest uh, uh, buyer um, and you can move on from there. Great. Thank you very, very much. Um, then we have a question related to mortgage. Uh, there's a, it's a few questions combined from a few people, but um, the main question would be, how does the 30% ruling affect the mortgage cap? Can that uh, make it uh, bigger or smaller or how does that go? Um, yes, uh, <laughs> it, it will affect uh, your, well, it can affect your mortgage capacity. Um, Essentially, how it works, you have the 30% ruling, if you benefit from it, then uh, you have a timeline of uh, five years. It's valid for five years, so that means that essentially uh, you have an additional benefit for five years as well. So in the end, your net income is, for the next five years, is higher than when you wouldn't have this 30% uh, ruling. This is something that the bank knows, something we know, so we know for the next five years you could borrow more money. But it also means, so let's say um, the, the average amount is approximately somewhere between, and it really depends on how long time uh, there is, of course, but when you really just start with this five term, uh, five years term, then the increase is, let's say, somewhere between the three and the 9,000 euros that you can borrow more. But then you have to repay this five to 9,000 euros in five years. If you compare that to having five or 10,000 10, euros repaid in 30 years, you can imagine that um, the repayment amount that you do per month is significantly higher with this 30% ruling. What I'm trying to say with this is, sure, if we need it, we can increase your maximum mortgage capacity somewhat, but then um, uh, your, respectively, your interest rate of your monthly payments will be higher for that, uh, for that part. Um, so if we don't necessarily need it, I would uh, choose not to, because then uh, you just have to uh, pay less for your mortgage, essentially. 
Uh, again, this is a very specific uh, or a question with a specific answer for each and everybody differently. So have somebody calculate it for you. Um, it will increase your maximum work capacity if we don't need it. I'd rather not. Great. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we have another question related to mortgage. Uh, so we have a person who uh, has more experience with banks who have a shorter um, uh, mortgage uh, repayment plan. Uh, mm -hmm. So the question would be, would it be best to have a short, the shortest feasible mortgage period or would a longer one be more um, preferable? Um, I would go for longer personally. Um, and the, there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, and again, it's really personal in the end. Uh, but what it means if you um, take mortgage for a maximum of 30 years, that's the maximum duration. Uh, well, that means you can always make additional repayments yourself. If you reduce that uh, duration of your mortgage, then you, you're stuck with this significantly higher monthly payments. Also, you can imagine you have a certain budget you can spend based on your income. There's a certain budget that you can spend. Um, this depends on the interest rates and how high your, in, how high your income is. So when, when you look at the uh, budget, you can imagine that if you take a mortgage for 10 years, the repayment is significantly higher when you borrow the same amount and when you spread it over 30 years. So that means a larger chunk of the budget will go to a repayment of the mortgage. So it means that you can borrow less if the, inter if the duration is shorter. So that's one of the reasons to go for 30 years, because then you can just you have the flexibility to borrow as much as you like really within the uh, range of your income. Um, so that maximizes your mortgage capacity. And if anything, if you'd like to repay faster, you can. Any bank allows you to make an additional repayment per year of 10% of the original mortgage sum. So if you take a mortgage for 400,000 euros, every year you can repay up to 40,000 euros. Um, so you can kind of mimic a quicker repayment of your mortgage. Um, what it also gives you is a longer duration, gives you the security that if um, uh, you can make additional repayments when times are good financially, when you hit a financial rough patch, then you can always fall back on this lower monthly payments of your duration. It's already kind of giving financial advice. There you go. Uh, so again, uh, be advised in your specific situation if it makes sense to have a short duration or not. Great, thank you very much. Um, next question would be, um, uh, again, it's a combination of questions, really common ones, uh, again, related to mortgage. Is there any difference in the interest rate if I have an EU passport? Um, and uh, in general, what, how does a residence situation or uh, origin of passport will affect the interest rate? Um, so no, the, the interest rate will not be affected. Um, the, the only thing is that there, uh, we work with over 35 different lenders and obviously we've selected them because that's not all lenders in, in the Netherlands. There are also lenders that are primarily focused on uh, Dutch uh, um, and, uh, 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 nationals, so Dutch uh, consumers, or maybe EU uh, people as well. We do work with them as well. Um, the only difference is that some banks are hesitant about uh, closing a mortgage for people outside of the EU for some reason. Um, so, but then they don't necessarily have the best interest rate as well. So the interest rate per se is not affected, uh, just the choice of different lenders is marginally higher, but nothing to worry about. The, the best lenders, best conditions you can find with uh, banks that allow anybody in. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Ludo, we have a little bit of a very interesting question here. Uh, does it make sense to buy a property in this crazy market right now? Are there any possibilities of the market to crash in the near future? Uh, and yeah, the general question would be, should we buy or wait until this chaos uh, is settled down? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, a, it's a good question, a question that we get uh, asked a lot. Um, well, first of all, disclose that I don't have a, a glass ball or anything like that. So I, I wish I could uh, look into the future. Um, but based on my experience and based on the forecasts that have been shared, um, it is still a good time to buy a home. The reason for that being is that prices are still expected to rise um, this year, next year, and the year after that uh, from the forecast that big banks have shared with us. Um, we do think that uh, potentially at one point, the market will stabilize a bit. We don't see a crash happening very uh, quickly, uh, but potentially stabilizing a little bit. 
Um, they said the same thing uh, five years ago. And if you bought a property five years ago and selling now, you're going to make an amazing uh, a profit on it. Um, plus, if you are going to um, buy now, or instead of buying now rent for three years, for example, and then buy, you are throwing away three years of rent that you could have potentially uh, put in your uh, purchase property, um, in your installments uh, and things like that. So um, generally speaking, our advice is still that it is a good time to buy. Um, of course, every month that you're waiting with buying, your money will uh, be worth less in that sense. Uh, but still, better put it in your bricks than uh, putting it in the uh, pocket of your landlord. Yeah. Great. That makes sense. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Lugas, who is turning, I guess, 36 this year. Uh, he will have his birthday um, uh, in, the in the 11th month, so November. Is he still liable not to pay the transfer tax if he buys before that? Um, yes. And of course, if he buys a property under 400K, um, well, no, I have to say that correctly. Uh, it is up to 35 years old. So unfortunately, if you are already 35 years old, then you are not exempt from paying transfer tax. Um, but uh, doing quick maths uh, from the top of my head, if you are from 87, then you should be uh, 84 still and turning 85 or 35 in um, November of 2022. So if you are buying a property before uh, the 4th of November 2022, under 400,000 or 400,000 euros or under, then yes, you are exempt from paying transfer tax. So indeed, um, hit us up and uh, let's get started uh, before it's November, because that yeah. can, uh, can, can save you uh, quite a nice amount of money. Yeah, totally agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, then another question uh, for you, Ludo. Uh, yeah, uh, you mentioned this before, but just to make sure that uh, it's clear for everyone. Mm -hmm. What about informal rental agreements? We have a person here who wants to spend uh, three to four months back home and they're thinking of renting to a friend for those three four months um but under an informal agreement um do they still need to talk to the bank or to the mortgage provider about it well it's, it's a little bit of a gray area but uh, generally speaking um if it's for three or four months uh, renting it out to a friend you know that's not needed uh, Right, Robin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, uh, coincidentally, I had exactly this question from somebody yesterday as well. So, I mean, it makes sense if you go on holiday for three, four months that you want to, and and you leave the house empty. You want to have a house sitter. It makes sense. There's house shorters anyway, so you might make a friend happy that they can stay in your house for some time. Um, and then, I mean, yeah, this it makes sense. Um, uh, it, it is good to kind of filter out who you're going to put in your in your house because if somebody really wants to um, uh, party like crazy then neighbors could make a bit of a fuss so just make sure that it's uh, uh, all good uh, but no this is perfectly fine great uh, then i have another question for the mortgage um it's a, a twofold question so uh, is there any regulation from the mortgage lender uh, obligating you to live in the property? And what happens if we want to sell the property within uh, three years? Are there any fines related to the mortgage in that way? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, if you buy a house and then you already, you, well, I advise you to already know what you were going to do with it. Um, if you know that you're going to buy it for your own use, then it will be your residential property and then you take on a residential mortgage as well and then yes and you have to be registered there and you, it has to be your primary residence because uh, if it's not then it automatically will be an investment mortgage that you have to take out and then it's for the intention of renting it out so you have to live in the property as well um, uh, so if there's a specific reason maybe specify where this comes from or schedule a call of course um, then um, uh, the other, you had, that was the second part. Sorry, could you repeat that? The second part would be, um, is there, um, so for example, if they want to repay the... Yeah, 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 I got it again, sorry. Uh, so if you want to uh, sell the house in three, four years, um, yeah, that's perfectly fine. Um, so uh, you can always repay your mortgage out of selling your house without a penalty with any lender at any time. 
Um, and also there's no taxes, there's no capital gains tax in the Netherlands. So if you have an earnings, additional earnings of 200,000 euros, just very well done, it's all yours. So that's, uh, that's all good. No penalties, no taxes, nothing. Okay, great. And then we have one last question. Well, there's a few other questions that I haven't answered, guys, because we have answered them in uh, um, the Q&A that we've made. If there's something that is not clear, please just contact us. You can have a free intake with us and with Mr. Mortgage so we can go over your questions and specific situation um, uh, more in detail. And then I have one more question. This is related to overbidding, Ludo. So mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, and a little bit with the mortgage, but here it is. Um, can I only get 100% of the value uh, as a mortgage, of the value of the property, which approximately 5% lower uh, is 5% lower from the bidding price? So that would mean that 5% that should be paid out of my own savings. Is that correct? Yeah, that's uh, that that is correct. So um, to give an example, if you made an offer of 100,000 euros, um, and um, well, or the the value of the property is 95,000 euros, then indeed the the bank will give you um, 95,000 euros, and you will need to spend the 5,000 euros out of own pocket to secure the home. Indeed. So um, when it comes to a, a buying agent's goal, we always try to buy either at market value or potentially lower than market value. Uh, but within the current market, um, we, we definitely try to buy at least at market value. Um, as you might have heard, sometimes it's indeed needed to add a little bit of own savings to, to make the highest offer and the most competitive offer. Uh, but together with our connections with appraisers, we try to push up the value a little bit so that we try to uh, get you the most uh, within a mortgage as, as possible. Possible. So indeed, um, you will only get up to 100% of the uh, market value as a mortgage amount. That is in a residential mortgage, that might be good to mention. Great, thank you very much. And then last question, I just saw that I missed it. Does the seller have a required time frame in which they need to respond to an offer? Well, um, not per se, but when we make an offer, we always put a deadline in the offer. Um, and uh, what we see is that generally, for example, if there's a deadline uh, today at 12, then um, they tend to come back to us by the end of today uh, if we have the offer accepted. Sometimes they take a little bit more time or if there's, uh, you know, the deadline's at Friday 5, then they might come back Monday morning. Um, but typically they come back at the same day and I always add, so if I make an offer today at 12, I put in the deadline tomorrow five. So then they have um, more than enough time to discuss, uh, the selling agent has more than enough time to discuss it with the sellers um, and they can let us know before the end of um, the next day. This is also because it is indeed an overheated market. Uh, sometimes you might be making multiple offers in the same week or sometimes even in the same day. So we need to know rather soon if we um, can move forward with that house or have to look at other properties. Okay, great. And then, uh, yeah, we have one most, more, more question which popped up from before. It was one that uh, I've accidentally missed. Uh, I think this is related to you, Robin. Uh, come people from the third world uh, and have no residence in the Netherlands own a property in the, in the Netherlands. So any other continent except Europe, but they don't have a residence here. Uh, anybody can own property. That's no, not necessarily a problem, uh, but you do, um, you have to be registered here to be able to apply for a mortgage or more importantly, you have to have uh, either a residential um, uh, permit, a residency permit, and you have to have um, a Dutch social security number, a BSN, it's called in the Netherlands. So those are the two requirements that uh, you would have to have. And of course, some sort of income. Now, you might have income from abroad. There are some banks that are okay with that. Uh, again, just uh, give us a call to, uh, to check in what your specific situation is and how we can work with that. Um, so that's it. Anybody can own property, um, but to close a mortgage, uh, you have to uh, comply to a certain set of rules and regulations. Great, then I guess that's it with the question, guys. Um, please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any more questions. There's a lot of information on our websites and also on the handbooks that we're gonna to send to you 
with the recording of this webinar. Uh, but yeah, if you still have uh, any gaps, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us. Exactly. And if you want to um, schedule a, um, a free intake, either with EHN or with Mr. Mortgage, uh, both are free and no strings attached to talk about your specific situation, please, uh, please reach out. We're more than happy to help you. For sure. Thanks very much, Katie, for answering the questions. And yeah. thanks, Robin, uh, for giving all the insights about mortgage-related topics. Um, and thanks uh, for all the attendees to um, join us today. And thank you for hosting again, Luda. No yeah, of course. Well, no problem at all. <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. See Bye, you everyone. Bye-bye.